It's raining out. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank God for the rain. Amen. And we can thank God for the rain of the Holy Spirit too, can't we? So we thank him for the natural rain. We thank him for the spiritual rain. So Lord God, we just thank you tonight for your rain. Lord, I thank you for those who are here, those who are participating online. Lord, let your spirit fall upon us tonight. Lord, let your spirit rain upon us. Open the floodgates of heaven, Lord, and let it rain on us. Lord, let our hearts be ready to receive that rain. Let it be fertile soil in our hearts, Lord, that receives what your spirit wants to give us tonight. We love you. We thank you for every good gift that comes from you. If it's rain, if it's cold, if it's hot, if it's dry, it all comes from you. So God, we love you. We worship you. We just give you the glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. if you're able to worship our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords.
what you say, I say. And what you pray, I pray. And what you pray, I pray, Jesus. Where you go, I go. What you say, I say. And what you pray, I pray. And what you pray, I pray.
Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your direction. We thank you for what you say to us. Lord, you thank you for how you lead us. Lord, we thank you for your holy scriptures, Lord, that teach us how to live. Lord, they're not just for us to read and not just for us to know, but for us to do. Hallelujah. So, Lord, we do what you tell us to do. We go where you tell us to go. We say what you tell us to say. So, God, we love you tonight. We want to honor you by obeying your word, not just in, in our minds, but in our actions. So help us to do that in Christ's name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Good evening. Hi, Ted. James, we're in James. Praise God for James. And James. <laughs> All right. So James, James, I was going to go Jameis. <laughs> it could be pronounced Jameis, right? J-A-M-E-S, Jameis, yeah. James? All right, we'll get it right. James has been talking, we looked the last two weeks at trials and temptations. And this week we're going to see him talk to us about the word of God. And it's important as we look back at the beginning of chapter 1 where it talks about trials and it talks about temptations where we were last week that we recognize that it's the word of God that we lean on during those trials. It's the word of God that we lean on during those trials and that we wield it like a sword, right? And it is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, as Ephesians tells us. And we wield it like a sword during our temptation. And so the key ingredient to a victorious, God-glorifying Christian life is how you deal with the Bible, how you deal with Scripture. And so believers are Bible people, right? Believers are Bible people. New Beginnings Church is a Bible-teaching church. If we ever stop teaching the Bible, we should close the door because there's no need for us then, right? You know, I was thinking today about COVID-19, and if you want to sound smart, you call it COVID-19. And if you want to sound normal, you call it the coronavirus. And if you're, not too, if you're way too sure of yourself or want to sound too sure of yourself, you just call it the Rona, right? And so we know what the keys have been as, as they've talked about us flattening the curve, right? What did they tell us to do? Wash your hands, stay apart, right? Wash your hands, stay apart. I hate social distancing. Because we should never socially distance. Maybe we should physically distance, but we shouldn't socially distance. We're, we're social beings, but I won't go on my tangent. So in fact, you've, over the last six months, has it been six months already? It's been pretty close to six months. We've heard so much about washing your hands and physically distancing that we're probably sick of it, right? We're so sick of it, and we're tired of it. But it's some basic skills that we should probably just during cold season, flu season, germs, whatever is going on, we should just wash our hands anyway, right? It shouldn't be any different than any other day. But you know, the Bible is that basic. The Bible is that basic to living a God-glorifying life. And it's basic to, to having a victorious Christian life. And it's basic to growing in Christ-likeness, right? So we are Bible people, amen? So we're going to look at James 1. 29 through 27 tonight, and we have a section that's largely devoted to hearing and doing the Word of God. Hearing and doing the Word of God. And so my goal today is to help you see how believers need to interact with the Bible. How are we to interact with the Bible? So let's read that passage, James 1, 19 through 27. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. A lot of us could listen to that every day and put that into a practice. Swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of a man of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and over and overflow of wickedness and receive the meekness, the implanted word. Get that? Receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. 
For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, he's talking about the word of God right here now, he who looks into the word of God and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he's religious, and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless." Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So the big theme, there's a lot in there, is the word of God, right? And it really begins with verse 18. So let's jump back a verse. In verse 18 it says, Of his own will he, referring to Jesus, brought us forth by the, was brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits in his of his creatures. So the word truth here um, is referring to the gospel, right? When he's referring to the truth. It's the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is what saves us, right? Jesus is what saves us. Then we see in that verse, the impl- or we saw in our passage, these phrases, the implanted word, we saw the word, we saw the perfect law, and we saw the law of liberty all in those passages. So this section, uh, this, the section's theme is about God's word or the Bible, which you're all holding in your hands or should be holding in your hands. And so believers must faithfully hear and, not or, and do the word of God. We're called to hear it and we're called to do it, right? Believing the Bible has to be more than just a statement of faith on our website. It's got to be more than that. Or it has to be more than some virtue that we aspire to. It needs to be fleshed out in our lives. We need to live out the word of God. So believers in Jesus will be concerned with hearing and doing. You guys are getting it, the word of God. So this passage tonight gives us three principles for this. Number one, we're to humbly receive the word. Humbly receive the word. So if we look at verse 21 of James chapter 1. It says, therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with what? Meekness. The implanted word which is able to save your souls. So James refers to the word as the implanted word. In other words, when we're converted, when we're born again, guess what God does? He writes his word on our heart. He implants the word in our hearts. So we are brought forth by the word of truth, which is the gospel. And so the word is key to our conversion, right? Because if, we if we're not saved by the word of God or through Christ with the word of God, then we're saved by some doctrine that who knows what there is. And then it remains key for our spiritual growth. We have to go back to the word after we get saved to know how to grow as a Christian, to know how to grow as a believer. And then as we grow, we go back to the word and it helps us grow more. And as we go, grow some more, we go back to the word and it helps us grow some more. And so, you know, the word needs to be planted in our hearts. And the rest of this is all rooted in the gospel. You know, only those that are changed by Christ will have a desire to come to the word the right way and obey it. We have to be changed by Christ to have that desire to come to the word and obey the word. Look at Jeremiah 31, 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. As, as those of us who are born again receive the word at salvation, we then have to continue to receive that and welcome it into our lives. I think I've told the story over and over that before I was saved, I'd try to read the Bible, and I'd like read a page, and I'm like, I don't get it. And then the next time I'd open the Bible, I'd try to read it, and I'd get a sentence, and I'm like, I don't understand it. And so someone shared the gospel with me, and I received the truth, right? Received Christ into my heart. And that night I went home, and I opened the word of God, and it was like somebody just translated it all, and I could understand everything I read. So back to verses 19 and 20 of James 1. They're a little bit debated if you, if you look at scholars and how they interpret it, but I want us to look at it like a proverb, like a proverb. And that, that it applies to, but it's not limited to the word of God. Uh, it's really describing someone who is generally teachable. So in order to be teachable, in order to receive and do the word of God, we have to follow 
James 1, 19 and 20. It says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So those are the qualities, when we go back to trials and temptations, like we've talked about in the last two weeks, those are the qualities that we need. We need the quality of being slow to speak. I'm sorry, swift to hear, slow to speak, right? And slow to wrath. And so if you are quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, you're then a teachable person, right? That's what makes us teachable, um, both before God and before others, and that requires some humility. Because sometimes it's hard for us to just close our mouths and open our ears and stop being angry, right? So, you know, we live in a social media-driven culture. And what's not popular on Twitter and Facebook is being quick to listen <laughs> and being slow to speak and being slow to anger. It's the opposite. If you spend any time on social media, everyone is out there just blaring their opinion, getting angry at everybody else, right? And if we can't be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger in everyday life, on social media, in the workplace, in a social setting, in our home, we certainly cannot be that way when we come to the Bible. I know that's hard to hear. If we can't be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger in everyday life, we certainly can't be when we come to the Bible. So generally speaking, our attitude towards God is not going to be drastically different than how you treat his image bearers. Think about that. Your, your, your attitude towards God won't be drastically different than how you treat the image bearers or people who are godly people, right? J.A. Moiter writes, Moiter, Matir writes, if we do not have an attentive ear in the ordinary circumstances of life, we do not become different people. We shut the door. I'm sorry, let me read that again. If we do not have an intent, if we do not have an intent, I'll get it. If we do not have a, an attentive ear in the ordinary circumstances of life, we do not become different people when we shut the door and open the Bible. Then he goes on to say, the great talker is rarely a great listener. And never is the ear more firmly closed when anger takes over. That's good. If you're angry, your ear is going to be shut, right? And so notice what, again, what James says in verse 20. For, for the wrath or anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So anger can't change your heart. Anger can't change your heart. It will prevent a heart change in you if you're angry all the time. And it can't produce a heart change in those around you or the people that you're angry with. So if I'm angry with Tad and I want to change his heart, blowing up at him is not going to change his heart. Right? It's going to harden his heart. And so if we go back to social media and we look at the rage of social media and the things that are going on and people ranting at others, maybe in person, that just doesn't work, right? All that does is put walls up between us as believers. It will not make you more godly to blow up at people. There's a time to have righteous anger, but we're not going to go there today, right? It won't make that other person more godly. It won't make your spouse or your kids more godly if all you do is get angry with them. Anger doesn't work. And so we, he, we see here in James, we, what we see here is James pr uh, promoting a general attitude of humble teachability, right? He's teaching us how to be humble and to be teachable and discouraging anger that can arise in trials and temptations. So usually when that anger comes, we're, we're struggling with a trial, we're tempted. Anger's sin, we know that, right? So if we succumb to anger, we're succumbing to temptation, aren't we? And so notice the actions and the attitude of receiving the word. We'll, we'll change a little bit. The action of receiving the word, one, is repentance, right? When you receive the word of God, naturally you repent, right? We put away all filthiness. We put away wickedness. And, and put away is the idea of taking off your dirty clothes, right? Without the intention of putting them back on again. A lot of us will put away our wickedness and we'll put away our filthiness, but we set it aside and we pick it up later and we reapply it to our lives again. But that's not repentance. Repentance is putting it away, like taking off dirty clothes, and never putting those dirty clothes back on again. Filthiness or moral uncleanness uh, is related to the word for earwax. So when you look at it in the Greek, it's related to the word earwax. Earwax means we're plugged up, right? 
So rampant wickedness, which is the excess of sin in, uh, of the old life, is what that means. So if we're going to receive and welcome God's word into your heart and life, we have to root out the sin in our life. So if we're rampantly sinning, our heart isn't prepared, isn't fertile soil for God's word. And so the weeds of sin will choke out the fruit of the word of God. You can't let sin grow in your heart and life and expect a, a fruitful experience with God's word. So if you're welcoming sin into your life tonight, you're not welcoming in God's word. If you're welcoming sin, you're not welcoming God's word. They're not friends, right? Have you ever seen a betta fish? Anybody ever see a betta fish? They're those really colorful, finny fishes, you know? And you don't really need much care. You can just put them in a glass bowl. They don't need a bubbler. They don't need much food. Um, and so they take little care. And you're usually told when you buy them, don't put two, don't get two, just buy one, right? Unless you separate them. If you have two bowls, you can buy two because they'll fight. They can't live in the same place. And similarly, you can't let sin grow in your heart and in your life and expect the word of God to flourish in the same place. It's like putting two betta fish in one bowl. They're going to fight and one of them is going to die, right? One of them is going to kill the other. And so if you want to welcome the word into your heart, we have to root out sin. And so the action is to root out that sin. The attitude is one of meekness or humility. We have to come to the word teachable, right? When we open the word, usually when I, when I read the word of God, when I study the word of God, the first thing I tell God is prepare my heart, prepare my mind. I try to clear my mind of the day's troubles. And so all the calls that Ted called me with today, I'm going to put that aside. I'm not going to let it bother me. <laughs> I'm not going to let Ted distract me. And, and so I clean my heart out and I prepare my heart to receive the word. So you come teachable when you read the word of God, right? You come looking to see, you know, the, the searching the word of God is like sifting through the word and trying to find the gems and the jewels in the word. And so you come to see what the word has to say to you because every day it'll say something different. You can read the same passages over and over and if you're searching with a teachable heart, they'll teach you something different. Not simply what you can get away from it, but how can it teach you? And so many times we treat the Bible like a buffet. We come to the Bible and we say, I'll take this and I'll leave that. I'll take this and I'll leave that, right? The Bible's not a buffet, is it? Um, that's not meekness, that's pride. That's saying, I only want to receive this from the word. I don't want to receive that from the word. That's not submitting to the word, but that's submitting to yourself. And so we need an attitude that says that this is God's word and I'm underneath God's word. I'm going to be obedient to all of it. The word is able to save your souls and it speaks the idea of sanctification. So first there's salvation, right? That justification, justified, never sin. Then there's the sanctification, which is that ongoing uh, purification and ultimately our glorification. That's three tenses of salvation, right? Justif justification, sanctification, and glorification. So the word plays a role in our growth. We cannot grow spiritually without the word of God. You can't. You can sing all the great songs you want. You can do all the great service you want. But if you don't put the word of God and, and study the word of God and put that in your heart, you can't grow without it. Amen? So number one is to humbly receive the word. Number two is to obediently respond to the word. So first we hear it, we receive it, then we respond to it. We read in verse 22 of chapter 1, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. The word of God is meant for more than just reading and knowing. Right? A lot of people know the word of God. They, could, they can recite the word of God. Remember the Pharisees? They could shoot an arrow at scripture, and, and, and they could tell you every word that that arrow went through. That's how well they knew the word of God. So they knew it. They read it, but did they actually do it, right? So, we, so it's more than reading and knowing. It's also mean, meant to be properly received, right? We have to obey it. We have to do what it says. And so we face the danger of deception or deception. And, the, and scripture says you deceive yourself, right? If you, don't, if you look into the mirror and walk away. But you deceive yourself if you're thinking that you're godly. If you're thinking that you're spiritual and you're thinking that you're mature because you've heard, read, and know the word of God. You're deceiving yourself, right? You're deceiving yourself. Spiritual maturity is not by what you know, but by what you do. Spiritual maturity is not judged by what you know, 
but by what you do. Because Satan knows the word of God. He went to Jesus and said, you know, if you throw yourself in the temple, doesn't the word say this? And he said, you know, if you're hungry, you're the son of God, you can make yourself bread. Turn this rock in. He knew the word of God, right? So when you hear without doing, you lead yourself astray. You deceive yourself and you cheat yourself. You are the one who suffers if you hear without doing. So we have, we have really two options with the word. We can hear it only, right? Know it in our head. Or we can hear and do it. We can hear and do it. The hearer only can be deceived, right? So if we just listen to the word of God and know the word of God, but don't actually live it out, we can be de deceived about our salvation. We can be deceived about our walk with God. And we can be deceived about our spiritual maturity. And so James gives us an illustration. He says, like a man who looks intently in a natural mirror. He's talking about a natural mirror. And then he says, then he forgets what he saw. So back at that time, think about mirrors. They weren't fancy glass with silver paint on the back, right? Like we have today. Mirrors at that time were polished bronze or brass. And if you had money, they could have been polished silver or gold. And so um, um, to see well, you had to get into the light right. Get into the right light is what I was trying to say. So like most of our mirrors today, they're bright. You shine a light in your bathroom. In that mirror, you can see yourself perfectly. But imagine it being brass or, or bronze or gold or silver. It's probably a little foggy, right? So you got to get into the right light. The reflection has to be just right. You had to be intentional to look into a mirror at that time and see yourself. And so James is saying that if a person walks away and forgets what they saw, they just wasted it. They just wasted the mirror, right? So if you hear the word and don't obey the word, you waste the word. If you hear the word, don't obey the word, you waste the word. So imagine you get up in the morning and you're getting ready for your day and the first thing you do is you look in the mirror, right? Your hair is a mess. Men, maybe Ted, you got some dinner, leftover dinner in your beard. And Joan's got some goop in her eye, right? And you do nothing. And you look in the mirror and your hair is a mess. You got food in your beard and there's goop in your eye. And you walk away and you just go about your day, right? And people are like, Ted, are you okay? And Ted's like, well, well, why? You're a mess, Ted. <laughs> Have you looked in a mirror today? <laughs> right? So a look in the mirror without follow-up, without action, is a waste of a mirror. Why have a mirror if you're not going to do anything with it? So most of us look in the mirror. If we see something out of place, we fix it. Right? Agree? Why, why else have a mirror? Right? So to look in the word... And then not fix what's broken in your life or in your heart by not doing what it says is wasting the word, just like you wasted that mirror. So there's a better option. You can hear and do, right? You can hear and you can obey. Verse 25 of chapter 1, James says, But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. So when we look into the perfect law, looking here means to intently search. It's not just a glance, like I'm going to look at Ted. No, I'm going to intently search and look at him with the intention to obey. So when we look into the perfect law, our intention is to dig into it with the intent to obey. So when we look into the perfect law of liberty, the word then brings us freedom. Because when we obey the word of God, we have freedom. So let's jump back to Jesus in John 8, 31 and 32. He says, if you abide in my word. That word abide is a big word. Live, dig, survive, get in there. If you abide in my word, you are my disciple indeed. And you shall know the truth and the truth will what? Make you free. There's freedom in God's word. There's freedom in God's word. You know, James' law doesn't refer to the law of, when, when James refers to law, he's not referring to the law of Moses, but the law of Moses as interpreted and supplemented by Christ. And, and he states uh, it's the idea that God's word has been written on our hearts and the spirit of God has taken up residence in us, right? The Holy Spirit, the reign of the spirit lives inside of us to empower us to obey it because in our natural flesh, we don't want to obey the word of God. It takes the spirit of God in us to give us that obedience, Roger Ellsworth writes, Satan works very hard to portray sin as the greatest freedom and God's word as the greatest bondage. But the reverse is true. 
right? We always hear people say, I'm not going to become a Christian. You Christians, you're bound by that Bible. No, we're freed by the word of God. They're bound in sin, right? People think that sin is freedom and the word is bondage, but it's completely the opposite. Sin is bondage and the word is freedom. James tells us to persevere. The person that looks into the mirror perseveres into the, I'm sorry, into the word, perseveres, abides in it. They stick with it, right? They don't walk away from the word. They walk in the word. And so he says he will be blessed in his doing. Notice the blessing is not the hearer, right? It's not the one that has good intentions. Not in being here at the time. It's in the doing. That's where he says they will be blessed. So let me ask you, how many have been blessed by reading a recipe? How many have ever cooked anything? I would imagine all of us have cooked something. You read the recipe and go, oh, I'm just blessed by that recipe, right? You know, I like to cook and I like to grill. Um, to me, when I have time, cooking is restful, it's relaxing. When I don't have time, it's a nuisance. But I don't read a recipe and go, that was so good. <laughs> I go, that would be really good if I cooked that, right? And, and I, I don't read a recipe and then I have the thought, oh, that just satisfied me. No, I think about what it's going to taste like, right? And so the blessing is in making it, but the bigger blessing is in what? Eating it, right? So when it comes to the word to just read and know and not do it, it's like reading about the cake, but never really baking the cake or eating the cake. You've missed the point. You just read it, right? And that's really the theme in Jesus' teaching. If we go in Matthew 7, 24, Jesus says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. So it's not just about hearing the word. He's saying, do it, right? Look at Luke eleven twenty eight. 28. Jesus said, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and do what? Keep it, which is an action of doing. Then in John 13, 17, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Revelation 1, 3, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. So he's saying, hear it, read it and hear it, but keep them, which is a doing them. Finally, Revelation 22, 7, right at the end of the Bible. Behold, I am, come, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. So the point James and Jesus are making is exactly the same. They're exactly the same. James is not going off base here by saying you need to be a doer of the word. We just read all over that Jesus said to do the word, keep the word. You don't just listen, you obey, you act on the word. To hear and not obey is wasting it. It's wasting it. How many love it when their kids hear them? Your kids hear you, but they don't obey you. It's time to go to bed. Yep, it's time to go to bed. I'm going to watch more TV. No, they need to hear and obey, right? So the blessing is in the doing. Bear with me because I know that we talk about we're saved by faith, by grace through faith, not of works, but... Bear with me, we'll get to that in a moment. So the blessing is in the doing. Those with saving faith are those who are doers of the word. Saving faith is doing faith, right? We're not saved by our doing, but those who are saved automatically do, right? So we don't get saved by doing, but because we're saved, we want to do, amen? Number three, so first humbly receive the word. Number two, obediently respond to the word. And number three, accurately reflect the word. So let's look at verses 26 and 27 of James chapter 1. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religious is use, religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to give oneself, uns, keep oneself unspotted from the world. So here he's getting very specific, right? He shows us what it looks like to obey the word. He's saying this is what it looks like to be a doer of the word. So when we obey the word, our lives will accurately reflect that, right? It'll accurately reflect that. It'll accurately reflect the teachings in the word. It'll accurately reflect the Bible in our lives. James is saying real religion, real practice of faith, 
real spiritual, spiritual, you know what I'm trying to say, spirituality, shows up in life, in real life. It's worthless to talk big and do nothing. It's worthless to talk big and do nothing. So this is what the word, this is what walking in the word looks like. James, I'm going to give you three areas here that James mentions. And these are not the only areas of what walking in the word looks like. These are examples. Um, the, the wider point is, is, is that the words impact, the words teaching impact should be reflected in all of our life. So as we look at the word of God, it should reflect everything that we do, right? How many have ever shopped at Ikea? Or have you ever bought something and it has this big old, it's all in pieces and you got to put it together, right? So Ikea is known for put it together yourself, right? Or you buy a lawnmower and it comes in a box, right? And you're like, okay, now I got to make this thing run. And so there's usually a picture in your instructions of what it's supposed to look like when it's all put together, right? And then if you don't follow the directions, you have extra screws, right? Or you don't have enough screws and you have some extra parts, right? Um, but there's a picture and this is what it's supposed to look like after you follow the instructions. If you ignore the instructions, it may not, you may not get what's in that picture, right? So the last time Katie bought a table from Ikea, it had three legs when she was done because she didn't follow the instructions. She just put it together and she was wondering why her table had three legs. So James has given us a picture. She, I don't know that she did that. I'm just giving her a hard time. James has given us a picture of what life looks like shaped by the word. So we're to look at the word of God. That's how we're supposed to be. That's what we're supposed to look like. But in order to do that, we have to obey it. Just like you do instructions when you put something together. So James is introducing three areas here. And, and kind of a topic guide uh, a topic of the remaining chapters. So he's introducing, number one, walking in the word means controlling your tongue. Ouch. Walking in the word means controlling your tongue. The tongue will reveal your heart. We see that all over in scripture. What comes out of the mouth starts where? In your heart. So if all you're doing is spitting vile words, then you've got vile in your heart. If all you're doing is spitting hateful words, then you've got hatred in your heart. You, cannot, you can deceive yourself into believing that you're, you're okay, but you can't, you're, if you think your tongue is not revealing your heart condition, then there's a problem, right? Our tongue reveals our heart condition. So walking in the word is controlling your tongue. Number two, it's, it's caring for others. So James says, care for the widows and the orphans, right? Or I don't remember how he worded that. Um, yeah, visit the orphans and the widows in trouble. And so true, true, truly walking with God will involve caring for hurting people. It'll, call, it'll, it'll result in helping those that need help. That's why we have the 420 where the 420 is. That's why we minister to people there all day long. Because if we're walking with God and following his word, it should be our desire to serve people. That's why we're going into the jail and teaching people in the jail how to live a Christ-like life. That's why we have transitional houses for people coming out of prison, because we're loving those that need love, right? So here's the po here he points out orphans and widows specifically, but that really applies to anybody that's in need. It doesn't mean you're an orphan or a widow. It could be an, a, a, a homeless person, right? It could be uh, uh, an ex-inmate who's trying to change their lives. I met with a guy today, actually, who um, I just checked him into one of our houses this evening, and the first time I met him, I don't remember when it was, but I met him in jail probably 12 years ago. Hard, hard heart, very hard heart, 12 years ago. And so I remember he'd come into jail, he'd want to meet with somebody, I'd minister to him, and he'd stick his nose up and walk out. And then he'd go to prison, and then he'd get out, and guess what, he'd get arrested, he'd go to jail. So over 12, it's about 12 years, I, every time he'd be in jail, he'd want to talk to me. And I, I would minister, I'd, I'd love on him, I'd listen to him, but then I'd share truth. And he didn't want to listen to the truth, he wanted to go back to who he was. And so he called me a couple months ago after another stint in prison, and he's like, I'm really ready to change. I'm really ready to change. And I said, so I talked to him, and, and I checked him into one of our houses tonight, and he said, what's, what's the name of the church that you, you pastor? And I said, New Beginnings. And he started to tear up. I'm like, what? 
And he's like, well, the, 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 the halfway house I just got out of in Rice Lake was called New Beginnings. And, and every time I've been listening to Christian music, it keeps telling me I need a new beginning. And now you're telling me today that you go, you're pastoring at New Beginnings Church. And so that's God. Was, he's been ordaining all this all along. So our job is to help those people, right? So he may have stuck his nose up at me 12 years ago, 10 years ago, 8 years ago. But there was something there that he, he continued to ask to see me. Every time he'd go to jail, he'd want to see me. They'd call me up, so-and-so wants you to see him. So I'd go there, and I'd go see him. And he'd stick his nose up, right? But God really worked through all that. So anyway, back to my point. James is pointing out orphans and widows, but it applies to all people in need, right? And, and um, the point is, is that we care. We care. And, you know, if we look at Christianity even throughout the centuries, that's why we see Christians leading mercy ministries throughout the centuries, right? They're, go, they're going to other countries. They're going to other nations. And so we should continue as believers to lead the way, right, in loving those who, who need to be loved and caring about injustice and caring about things like abortion and caring about, you know, women who are violently abused and caring about all of those people in the world that are hurting, and as our world is crumbling in front of us, more people are hurting. And so our world crumbles a little bit more, and there'll be more people hurting. There's, you know, a lot of people say, well, we've, we've been Christians for 2,000 years. We've reached everybody. Well, the world's such a mess, it keeps breaking people, right? They need love, and they need care. And so we should be con caring, concerned, active people. So that's number two, walking in the word, controlling the tongue, caring for others. And the third point he makes is casting off our worldliness. So James will deal again with worldliness as we get further in the book. But he's speaking uh, about purity and holiness and not letting the world's ways inform our values and our behaviors. That's how the world operates, right? They let the worldly, the worldly view dictate uh, their values, which are horrible. Dictate their behaviors. Look at all the rioting and the ruckus that's going on in our world. That's because of the, the world view is dictating that. We need to let scripture dictate our values and let scripture dictate our behaviors. So James says it's not enough just to be morally upright. You have to care about the hurting and the helpless. It's not just enough to be socially active. You are to be morally upright, right? It's not enough to live a pure life and to care for people. You need to control your tongue is what he's telling us. So the point, the world should shape every, the word should shape everything about you. What comes out your mouth? what you do, right, how, what you believe, what your values are, what your behavior is like. And so the truth is, is none of us have perfectly heard and obeyed the word, right? None of us have perfectly obeyed and heard the word, but that's why Jesus came, right? Only he perfectly obeyed the word. Jesus is the only one. He perfectly reflected the teaching of God's word, and he lived a life that we could never live, right? And he died the death that we deserve to die for our sin. So that you and I can be saved. So that we can live a transformed life. So that we can be transformed into being doers of the word. That's why Jesus came. Right? On our own, without Jesus, we can't do that. We're not transformed. We can't change. We're just going to end up eternity in hell. But he died the death that we deserve for our sin and he rose again so that we could be saved and be doers of the word. Let's stand, if you would. So you may all, I, I know most of you in this room and those of you who are online, you may have heard the gospel at one point, right? I know those of you in this room have. But those that are participating online, you may have heard the gospel and the word of truth, but has it been implanted in your heart? Did you just hear it or did you put it in your heart? Did you believe it? Have you welcomed it? Have you received it? And have you been transformed by it? And so being a doer of the word begins with being a believer of the gospel. That Jesus came, right, and died for your sins. That he was buried, right? That he lived a perfect life, first of all. Died for our sins. Was buried rose, and rose from the dead and sent the Holy Spirit to live inside of us. So being a doer of the word means that you're a believer of the gospel, right? Right? So if you're a believer, 
which most of you are, how are you interacting with God's word tonight? How are you interacting with God's word? Are you humbly receiving God's word? Are you obediently responding to God's word? And is your life reflecting God's word? That's how it should be. We should humbly receive it. We should obediently respond to it. And we should accurately reflect it. And then think about what areas of sin that do you need to root out of your life. Are there certain areas of sin that you need to root out? So we can't deceive ourselves. We need to hear and do the word. Amen? So God, we just love you. We thank you that you have given us your word, your holy scripture. Lord, that's just full of wisdom. And so, Lord, help us to receive that into our hearts. Help us to be humble about it. Help us to not pick and choose what we think is good for us and what we just choose to ignore. Lord, that's pride. That's not humility. Help us to be humble and help us just to sift through that word, Lord, and take in everything that we can take in. Lord, then obediently respond to that word. Do what that word says. And let that reflect out from our lives, Lord, accurately. So, Lord, we should be walking out the word that we're putting in our heart, the word that we're responding to, we should actively walk that out in our lives. So Lord, help each one that's here tonight, help each one that's participating online, help us have that desire to hunger and thirst for your word. Because that's where the rubber meets the road, really. So we can hear from all kinds of people, and, and you all heard from me tonight, but unless you hear from the word of God, I'm just a sounding symbol making noise. So God, we thank you for your word, that your word is truth, that it doesn't change. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, your word is set in history. It's set in eternity. And so God, we thank you that you've given us the word of God to follow. You've given us the word of God to obey. Lord, that's the key. We can just hear it, but we need to hear and obey it. We need to be doers of the word. We need to hear Jesus' commands and keep them. Lord, then the truth will set us free. So God, we thank you. We thank you that you give us that ability to walk in your word, to walk out your word. Lord, I pray that each person that's here tonight or participating has that hunger and that desire to know more about you from your word. Lord, because we can hear story after story after story, but if we go to the source, the word of God, that's a pure, unadulterated word of God. It can't be, it can't be twisted. So help us to hunger and thirst for that word. Help us to apply it to our lives. Help us to live it out each day. So God, we love you. We thank you. We just give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
thank you, Lord, for the word you gave us tonight. We hear and we do. We thank you, Lord, for the implanted word that grows, that brings forth fruit. And we become the first fruits unto God because we become what you've planted in us. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name.